Hello and welcome to this edition of the Angels and Destiny show. Why is this show called this, you may ask? So I'll tell you. The accepted meaning of angel is messenger and the accepted meaning of destiny is to make them establish. So my guests and I bring you messages to establish what you need to know in the present. And also I like working with angels and the calmness they bring. Now, in a moment, I'll introduce you to my wonderful guest, Ruth Bowen. But before that, I'd like to say thank you for watching the show live at a later date, as it means a lot to me to connect with like-minded women. Now, if you've never met before, then my name is Ray, and I love to help women to crossroads in their life, heal their past, create their future, transform their present, so they can take control of their destiny in the here and now. I am the founder of Radiant Angel Energy, and I use future life progression, past life regression, angelic Reiki, meditation, angel cards, and hypnosis to help women who feel lost get clear on their destiny and their reason for being here. Now, each episode of the show will cover various themes of your journey, a mini guided meditation or angel card reading with the wisdom of my wonderful guests, like today's guest, Ruth Owen, who will be sharing her personal story of coming from ground zero to help inspire you. Now, Ruth is a Mind Valley certified master trainer, a coach and mentor for women who have been through separation and divorce. Ruth started her career as a broadcast journalist in radio and TV in the UK before moving to the Caribbean to work as a promotions manager for a publishing company. Ruth then joined a startup business that ran boat trips across the Caribbean, setting up local offices, recruiting and training tour guides, writing tourist guides and books for the various islands. Now, after getting married and moving to the Republic of Ireland, Ruth had six children in eight years amazing all while traveling with the family back and forth from Ireland to the Caribbean again amazing um, now post the balls Ruth went into business with a partner to establish a successful French bakery in Dublin sounds absolutely wonderful winning a business woman of the year award Ruth has worked with personal development leaders such as Joe Patale and has brought all of these skills together to help empower women to take charge of their destiny so without further delay, hello, Ruth, and welcome to the Angels and Destiny show. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Ray. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. And you have such a, a wonderful list of attributes and, and skills and uh, things that you do. It's quite astonishing. So I'm very honoured to be here. So thank <laughs> you for inviting me. Oh, that's wonderful. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. So before we get into this fascinating conversation, I want to remind you that you can also ask questions, leave comments and thoughts, as both Ruth and I want to be part of this conversation. So please do not be shy. We'll try to say hello to everyone who says hello and ask, answer any questions or comments live or once the show is finished. And if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, then give it a thumbs up and subscribe to it so you can get the updates and all my recordings. So Ruth, why don't you tell us more about yourself and how you came from ground zero? It happened over a very long time. I think with a lot of people who go through a relationship that turns out to be abusive in the end, it happens very gradually, very incrementally over quite a long period of time. And by the time you realize what's happened, it's kind of too late to actually try and pull back and, and gather yourself. Um, and I found that after 18 years with uh, my partner, who then became my husband, it had happened so gradually, bit by bit, that I had become isolated from all my family and my friends and my support systems. And then the fact that we had so many children, also concentrated my, my mind and my efforts in that particular direction. So I wasn't able to step back and evaluate where I was going with my life and what was actually happening. And the, the more time that went by, the less control I had over who I was which was an awful realization, but it was only when I got to that absolute breaking point where I thought this cannot go on anymore because if I stay in this relationship and this marriage, I'm gonna die. I'm either going to die because my heart is broken and nothing I can do is gonna make it any better or I'm physically going to 
damage myself um, and, and end up dead. So it, that was, that was a, a real ground zero point for me, realizing that it had come to that point where I had tried and tried and tried to be that person that my husband at the time wanted me to be. I was incredibly desperate to, to have his approval. But because nobody from the outside was saying, well, hey, is that right? Is that reasonable? Mm. Is that acceptable? I was lost in this world of, of him saying everything I did was wrong, mm. that um, everything I did was criticized. Everything I did was not good enough. And I think as women, we put that pressure on ourselves. And I think we are far too willing to accept that judgment from other people, especially our partners, our husbands, our families. And, and I think we have as women to recognize the fact that, that because we are so compliant, because we are so conscious of putting other people first, especially families, that we have to, we have to look after ourselves first. Mm -hmm. Because if that doesn't happen, if you don't take charge of yourself, nobody else is going to do it for you. And people will take and take and take. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know, Ray, and I'm yeah. sure our listeners and, and participants know that too, that if you give an inch, whoever it is who's willing to take advantage of you will take a mile. And, and so that for me was, was the point where I thought, I have to take stock here and I have to really consider what is going on. I mean, the, the breaking point for me in the last year, 18 months of our marriage, things had got progressively worse. So in, in, in 18 months, I got arrested in America and was about to be thrown into jail because I was trying to catch up with my husband who was going 90 miles an hour. And we were late to catch a plane. I had two babies in the back of my car. I was terrified because it was um, bad weather, but I had to keep up with him and I got arrested. And I was standing by the side of the road in Colorado and it was minus two degrees. I was standing there with handcuffs on and my hands behind my back. And do you know, my husband never called. He never turned around. He never came back. He never asked if I was okay. And when I got finally, um, I was threatened with being thrown in jail for the weekend because it was a Friday afternoon. The traffic patrol officer said the judge had gone home for the weekend and I will be thrown in jail for the weekend to appear before him on Monday morning. Oh, and by the way, he said he was going to charge me with child abuse because I had been speeding above the speed limit. And he was going to take the two babies, who were then one and three, into care. At that point, I nearly lost it, as you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting in his patrol car for 45 minutes with his handcuffs on behind my back. There were tears rolling down my face. I couldn't do anything about it. My nose was all dribbly, snotty, and all the rest of it. Couldn't deal with it. Eventually, after 45 minutes, I got out, drove to the airport. My husband was standing by the side of the road waiting for me. It was minutes before the flight was due to take off. And instead of saying, as you would imagine your life partner to do, you know, oh my goodness, what a terrible thing. How are you? You know, come here, let me give you a hug. Are you all right? No, he was angry that I had allowed myself to get caught, that I'd inconvenienced him, that, uh, you know, I'd caused him stress. Um, that, that was a real big wake up call for me. And then uh, it, it later, six months later, um, you know, it was, it, we had the, the Christmas from hell, absolute hell. And when he left uh, um, to go to, uh, to work after, because he left me in charge of five children 
uh, oh, and by the way, I had to do <laughs> to do the job of the building manager that he had hired that was incompetent, so he sacked. So I had to do that job as well. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and I'd never been a building manager in my life, you know, dealing with tenants and and you know broken air conditioning units and and a, and the carpet that need replacing, all that kind of stuff, you know. So I had to juggle all of that, and you know, I thought, oh my god, you know, how can I do this? But I did it, and not only that. When he left, he said to me, you know, I'm so angry with you. You know, this has been, you know, the worst Christmas ever. And I, I'm going to disappear for six weeks and I'm not going to contact you. So for six weeks, I had no contact with him other than a very terse email. Have you done this list? 28 things. I need this done by this date. Nothing of, of any description that was loving, endearing, supportive, nothing. I was like an employee, an employee who was hated, reviled, and, and abused <laughs> in all sorts of ways. And, you know, I spent the first half of that six weeks in absolute terror and just feeling that I was useless, worthless, you know, I'd done everything wrong. It was all my fault, etc. But guess what? I took each day as it came and I made my list of what needed to be done. And I applied myself. I, I, I kind of shut out everything else. And I concentrated on what needed to be done to get through the day, to get the jobs done. And bit by bit, what I was doing unconsciously, I was proving to myself that I was mm -hmm. capable, that I was able to do it, and that I could operate without him. And you know, at the end of six weeks, I was a changed person because I had realized I'm not all these things that he says I am. I'm not an incompetent. I'm not somebody who is worthless. I can do this. I, I, I've juggled motherhood with five young children. I've juggled a job that I knew nothing about in a foreign country. And I, I've done it. And I've achieved a lot. And people have said, great, great job. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And I've gone above and beyond what was asked of me. And I did it to the best of my ability. And I think if you do that, if you do those little things bit by bit and prove to yourself that you are worth your weight in gold, that you are a valuable human being, that people can rely on you, then I think that, to me, that was the beginning of me seeing that perhaps there was a future without this awful kind of pit in the stomach dependency on somebody else's opinion. Mm -hmm. It's only somebody else's opinion of you. And I've made the mistake of thinking that was the truth, that that was reality, that what he said was actually what I was. And I proved to myself that that wasn't the case. And that to me was the beginning of me saying, I can be independent. I can live without this horrible, sickening, sinking feeling the whole time. Because it's, it's a nightmare to live with. It's not living. It's existing moment to moment. Because when I went to the solicitor, by the way, that was another story. I had to escape. I had to escape. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and he, he saw me. He, he saw me go out the back gate. And, uh, to, you know, he, he jumped into his car and chased me. And, Ray, we were driving at 90 miles an hour on these tiny little lanes in Ireland. Wow. Uh, and I was absolutely petrified of what he would do to me when he caught me. And, fortunately, I knew the back lanes better than he did. So I was able to escape and go another route. And I was so terrified that I drove into the local town 
in Ireland. And I, I parked outside the Garda station, you know, the police station. Yeah. And I, and, and I just had to sit there. I was shaking so much. I couldn't move for 20 minutes. And, and then the police car, patrol car came along and they said, uh, they said, uh, hello there, uh, whose car is this? And I said, oh, it's my husband's. Hmm. And where, why are you sitting here? And I said, well, I was terrified that what he would do to me because um, he just chased me around the lanes and I came here for safety. <laughs> So I said, what I want to do is drive up to Dublin to see a lawyer tomorrow because I want a divorce. He went, no, oh. because he just called saying somebody had stolen his car. So you see, there were all sorts of, uh, you know, tactics that he used. Um, you know, that was another thing. Um, I forgot what the thread of what I was saying. Uh, I was telling you uh, <laughs> something else. <laughs> well, it was your escape, really, to go um, to see the solicitor. Yes, um, yes. Which was the next year. Oh, that's, that's what I was going to say. That, that's what I was saying, right? Uh, when I went to see the solicitor and to explain the situation, I said, do you know what? I said, I've been with this person for 18 years, but I feel like a piece of flotsam on the sea. I feel like a piece of driftwood that is tossed with the waves and the, the tides. I don't have any sense of who I am. I don't have an anchor. I don't have any roots. All of that has been chipped away, and I'm at the mercy of this person's daily, yeah. sometimes hourly uh, moods. So if he's in a good mood and the, the sea is calm, then I get a nice ride. Um, and then all of a sudden the storm comes up and I'm tossed, tossed around like a piece of wood. So um, it, uh, it, it's not a good way to, to be. And I think, you know, if, if anybody else is, is feeling that way, you have to, you have to look for a way to anchor yourself. And the way to do that is, is to, to go within. The answers aren't out there. The answers are always within. But I think we have to get better and we have to understand that the way to, 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 to access that wisdom, that knowledge, and the way forward for us is to retreat and, and go inside and listen to that small voice because we all have that small voice. Mm. The Jiminy Cricket voice. Yeah. You know, it says, oh, you know, really? You want to do that? <laughs> when you know it's the wrong thing to do. Um, but uh, I, I think we have to hone our skills better. And we do that through, you know, meditation, through connection to source, to spirit, to higher self. We don't... I think we are in a, a, a world where there is so much distraction. Mm -hmm. There is so much opportunity to flip from this to that to the other. And if you're not, if you're not conscious of where you spend your time, it soon goes and then you're too exhausted to look after the really important things. So I think for me, it was about, you know, pulling my horns in, and really taking stock of who I was and who I wanted to become. And I started reading an awful lot of um, self-help books and self-development things. I started following Mind Valley on uh, YouTube. This was, you know, 2008, 2009, so it was yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> and I remember thinking then, Wow, wouldn't it be cool to work for my <laughs> <laughs> They are such a cool company. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it's uh, it's rather amusing that that now I I, I do uh, full day seminars for them. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing what you can manifest. <laughs> ex ex exactly, and it's it's kind of like. Um, you know, but as you said, you you set those those little those little goals, and that you know each day, well, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, and it and sort of like finding who you really are. 
rather Absolutely. than what other people think you should be um or projecting or projecting themselves onto you as to what as as, as to what you should be exactly and you know the thing is nobody nobody can change anybody else they are who they are you are who you are you don't have control over anybody else you don't have the right as they don't have the right to put their expectations on you so i think if the less we have in our head that you know certain people should behave a certain way I think you're setting yourself up for, for a, a bit of a clash mm. because people will never behave as you would like them to behave. You have to accept people as they are. The only thing you have control over is yourself, right? And um, what I concentrated on was, was making myself as, as good as I could be, uh, learning as much as I could, uh, not being as judgmental, because I was terribly judgmental towards myself. I, I, I saw myself from my ex's point of view at the time, yeah. and I saw my shortcomings. And, yeah, none of us are perfect, and I have shortcomings. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yes, exactly. But now I think, yeah, great, I embrace them. You know, sometimes yeah. I get a bit frustrated with myself. <laughs> But, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's all part of the package, isn't it? I think if we were all perfect, it would be quite a boring world, actually. <laughs> it, it, it would be, really, but, yeah, because there wouldn't be all those little nuances about, uh, about people and, and everything going, don't like you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why on earth did, Ray, why on earth did you do that today? <laughs> you know, yes. That was a bit silly. <laughs> And that, so when you sort of like um you know you you you've, you've gone and seen the divorce lawyer and you kind of like got got the divorce you know it must have been pretty scary kind of like trying to set up by yourself with with the kids it was awful um you know for the first 3 years for for 3 years after that i was still living in the family home um the lawyers recommended that I didn't move out because it would then be uh, taken by the court as as um, the fact that I could be self-sustaining. But I, I, I couldn't at that time. I didn't have any means of support. I didn't have a job at the time. Um, I, I, I didn't have anything to fall back on. And in fact, nothing was in my name which is what I found out subsequently. So, so none of the property was in my name, none of the cars, uh, you know, because we, we had a, a stud farm. So there were various cars that were used by members of the staff and, and what have you. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite a shock to realise that I actually didn't exist. Mm. You know, everything was in his name. And so to stake my claim in the court's eyes, I had to stay in that house and it was just hell. You know, if I thought things were bad before, after I put in the papers um, and uh, in, in Ireland, you can't ask for a divorce straight away. You have to ask for a judicial separation, right. which is not as final. And, uh, you know, it's all very long and drawn out and what have you. But um, no, there were there were times when he got his employees to make my life hell. There was one occasion where I wanted to go away for just for the weekend with the kids, just to get away, and he was mm. traveling. And uh, and we packed little overnight bags, and we just wanted to go to a little B and B for the weekend. And we put the stuff in the car and it was, it was kind of winter, so it was dark about five o'clock. And it took us about half an hour to do that. And I drove around the, the, the house to the entrance to uh, the property. And he had seen us do preparing our bags and whatnot on the CCTV. Mm. And he'd asked his employee to put the to drive a tractor and block the entrance 
because we then we couldn't escape. Mm. We were trapped, you know, and that's how I felt. I felt like a prisoner there. Uh, it, it was just horrific, and there were all sorts of other tricks that he used, yeah. for, you know, to make my life really, really difficult. But um, <laughs> you know, I, it was a real sense of triumph, you know, when <laughs> whenever I had a minor victory. <laughs> So how how did you manage to you know to 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 cope with that without kind of like breaking down or or did you yeah. break down or well I I well there there were several coping mechanisms but um, there were times Ray when I thought I don't know if I can make it to the end of this day uh, there were there were months and months where it seemingly there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we had two sets of, of legal proceedings um, because I had served papers in Ireland, but then he served me with divorce papers through the Caribbean. Right. And that delayed me. I was about to get on a ferry and go and see my mum, who was in hospital. She was really sick. So that delayed me 24 hours. And by the time I got to my mum's um, hospital bed, she was already in a coma and she never came out mm. of it. So I missed that last opportunity for a chat. But I was with her when she passed away. Yeah. And that was it, that was such a privilege to be with her. Um, and um, yeah, that was right before I went to the High Court because we had, uh, I was in the witness box in the High Court in Ireland for six days, which wow. is, yeah, which is a heck of a long time. I tell you what, it is the loneliest place on the planet, being in the witness box, because you cannot discuss things with anybody. You can't discuss the case with uh, friends, relatives, even your lawyers. So you are completely isolated. You have no one to say, how am I doing? Should I do this? You know, should I say this? Nothing. You are on your oh own. God. It is, it, it, it's really quite awful um, and I remember uh, about three weeks before I went to the high court for the first hearing um, and my mum had died two weeks earlier and a friend of mine came to stay in Dublin and we went out for dinner and he said Ruth he says you seem to be really calm and you seem to be coping with this amazingly well I, he said what's your secret I said well do you know what I've realized I've realized that I'm grateful for all of it, for everything. And he kind of looked a bit confused. And I said, because I know, because of all of this that's happening, I'm becoming a better person. So I, I, very early on, it was bef before I came across Mind Valley, and, and, and it, you know, they really, really push the fact that gratitude and, and mm. uh, compassion and forgiveness are massive when it comes to evolving as a, as a human being and of moving yourself forward and moving out of that victim mm. mentality into a higher level of existence where things don't get to you as much that you are able to kind of float through life. It, it's not that you don't get upset it's not that you don't get affected by things, it's that you are able to cope. And I, that, that for me was the beginning of the realization that not only could I deal with things, but I could, in a sense, cope with it without, without it really pulling me back down. So I, I, I kind of grew a, a, a small set of wings at that point you know what I mean? I think, mm. I think, when you when you find you you've you've got something that elevates you a little bit, you do you feel like you're you're growing a set of wings, and that you are able to lift yourself out of that situation, whatever situation you're in, and you're able to kind of float above it for a bit, and that gives you immense power as a person. And I think women especially, we have to give ourselves permission to grow those wings 
and to lift ourselves out of, of what, whatever other people are trying to do or say or make us do or be, we have to find our own way. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it is kind of like how we we really do, um, you know, cope cope with things and and how we can actually um, we we can actually do it. So you've so you've kind of like gone through. You've you've finally got the balls after being in that box for six days. I mean, I mean that's a that's an awful long time to to yes. To, to 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 be in to be in the box um so did you were you able to stay in the home or was that okay now i can uh, you know we can leave we can set up elsewhere oh well that was all decided by the court that um you know we had to sort out um the the finance and uh, get that sorted and that was that was through the other court so there was a lot of toing and froing and back and forth, and oh, it was it was endless. And I had four lots of lawyers. <laughs> it was just the first one I sacked because um, he was just useless. And um, then I had to hire a second one who he he sacked me because I did a deal in the Caribbean <laughs> without his permission. So he sacked me. And then the first one sued me for payment, even though I hadn't got any money. So I had to hire a fourth one to defend me against the first one. It just went on and oh on. Oh, my and, God. And, and the lawyer that I had in, um, in the Caribbean, I'm sure he was being paid off by the other side <laughs> because he was not acting in my best interest at all. So, uh, you know, I, I was kind of besieged on all sides, but... The only thing you can do is 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 actually um, you know try and get through the day, and if you can, laugh at it you know, because you know what, what's the alternative? You kind of you know want to do, want to you know take a gun to your head, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if I if I wrote out all the things that have happened, I think people would have difficulty in 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 understanding it or or at least believing it. But it's all true. But but I want to tell you a really funny story um, about appearing in court um, because six months before we went to court, um, my husband at the time said, um, he said, I'm going to hire a Rottweiler who's going to tear you to shreds in the witness box. So, of course, I was absolutely petrified. And uh, so anyway, um, the first the first hearing was two days um, and I won my point. So then um, a couple of weeks later, we go back for the second point, which he also contested. So this, um, this lawyer was, was employed. And, and bearing in mind, this is in the family court. But my ex had employed a criminal barrister. Oh. Because he, he meant business, right? That he wanted to really give me a hard time. So anyway, after day four, I could see where the questioning was leading, you see. And I, I said to this lawyer, I said, he asked me a question. I said, Mr. McDermott, I said, you might be one of the best criminal barristers in Ireland, but let me tell you something. I'm not a criminal. And the judge started roaring with laughter. <laughs> and all, all, <laughs> all the solicitors started laughing. I, was, I wasn't expecting that. I said, and I'll tell you another thing. He said, I said, um, my husband told me six months ago that he was going to hire a Rottweiler to tear me to shreds in the witness box. Well, you're not going to do that either. And this fellow, was, he was bright red and he was hopping from foot to foot and he was <laughs> shuffling his papers and he went, uh, Rottweiler? Said, oh, well, I always thought of myself rather as a hush puppy. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the court just erupted into laughter, you see, and the only person who wasn't laughing was my ex. And steam was coming out of his ears and he was going redder by the second. Um, and this guy, this, this very eminent uh, criminal barrister, sat down. That was the end of his cross-questioning. And I came out of that courthouse feeling about 10 feet tall. I and it, I caught his eyes. He came out and he was... 
scuttling along with all his files and whatnot. And he caught my eye and he put his head down and he shuffled off as quickly <laughs> as he could. And I thought, yeah, I beat you. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, and, and Joy, um, who's watching, has said, is it not great that you can laugh at all? Humour is always good. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. You're right, Joy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugh, Hugh, Hugh can can cover you know can cover can cover a lot of things and can get you through some really tough times. Um, Absolutely. If if you need to, although, although obviously so it can be hard at the time it's actually happening. Oh um, yes. To actually yes. feel. Yeah, yeah, but but the other thing I used to do when I used to get sort of so frustrated and angry and you know this this build up of steam so. I started doing uh, Krav Maga, you know, the self-defense um, uh, system. They developed it for the Israeli army when they were, were doing hand-to-hand -hand combat and things. So uh, in theory, anybody can do it, uh, mm. no matter what your size or shape or your level of fitness. So um, I thought this was a great way to relieve the the pressure i was feeling to get to just get physical and get sweaty and and get you know, beaten up by these <laughs> sweaty guys in a room you know <laughs> it was just brilliant and honestly i came out of that feeling just a hundred feet tall you know it was just a wonderful way to get rid of all that build up of energy and frustration and anger and, and the other thing I used to do I used to go marching around the countryside shouting at the top of my lungs at all these cows in the field <laughs> they must have thought who is this not <laughs> <laughs> but I think when you when you have that kind of um build up of pressure it's a great release, you know, sort of, I used to drive along sometimes as well, shouting out of the window, um, just to let it out, you know, yeah. don't keep it in. Um, and if you have somebody to laugh with, then then that's a great release too. But um, yeah, just get rid of it, you know, <laughs> move on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you've got, yeah, you, you've got, you've, you've got to, you've got to let it out, because if you keep it inside, it just, sort of like grows and grows and that doesn't do you any good no um, exactly yourself you know it, it's like it's like the forgiveness thing if you don't forgive then it just eats you up inside um so you it can't does. can't move forward it does um and i and i i worked that out very soon very you know very soon after um uh, i decided i didn't want to be married anymore um the uh the father who married us, the uh, the priest, um, wrote me a letter to say, would I reconsider? Oh, I was so angry. Um, so I asked for a meeting with him and went mm. to see him. And I said, you know, this is unacceptable. Um, you can't ask me to, to reconsider. I have tried for 18 years and I am at my wit's end. However... You know, in spite of all the things that are going on, in spite of his redoubling his efforts to keep me locked down and, and thwart me in my efforts to get out and escape, <laughs> um, I forgive him because I don't want to carry that burden anymore. I don't want to have that sort of heaviness sitting inside me. I said, it's not going to affect him. He, he won't feel the effects of whether I forgive him or not, but I'm not prepared to, to carry that around. So, so I forgive him. So um, I know for a fact that, that I will never be forgiven. No. But, but, you know, that doesn't really bother me anymore. It's, uh, it doesn't affect me. So. No, no, because that, that's his issues that he has, that he has to deal with. Yeah. Um, because, because, um again i think it's something that we, we sometimes forget we're all on our own individual paths when we get caught up with other people we forget that um that we are actually our own path we create our own destiny our own future where we should be going and that's what we're here for not to yes. be part of somebody else's you know it's 
they had to deal with what they had to deal with, we had to deal with what we had to deal with. That's a, such an important thing to remember, isn't it? Um, mm. Thank you for, for saying that, Ray, because uh, I, I think sometimes we get so caught up in, in, in other people's missions and ideas and, and, and dreams that, again, I, I found that my dreams and ambitions just melted away because I was so caught up in, in, in what his dreams and ambitions were and, and his goals and, and his kind of, you know, agenda that I completely forgot about mine. But it's it's... I know it's so difficult when you have children because mm. that's what we do naturally. We, 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 we put them first and we, we make sure that they have all their needs met first before ourselves. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a really, really difficult balance to get. But um, there, there were times where, when I thought, I don't know if I can do this. You know, I had sort of, all these little ones and um, you know, tea time was, was kind of like breaking point. I remember at one point uh, it had been the day from hell and uh, things had gone horribly wrong and I'd done tea for the, the kids and there was food everywhere and there was pl you know, plates everywhere and dirty pans and, and I thought, oh God, I can't face uh, bath time just yet. So I think I'll, you know, I sent them all out to play and I think, I'll just have a gin and tonic. So I got a gin and tonic. <laughs> and I sat there in the kitchen thinking, oh, when will this be over? Um, and my four-year-old comes in and she stands there with her hands on her hips. She's a bit of a madam. She still is now. She's <laughs> <laughs> She'd love you for saying that. <laughs> she goes, mummy, what are you doing? And I said, well, darling, I'm really tired. So I'm just going to sit and have a drink. Uh, before we go to do bath time. She goes, is that your drink? And I said, yes. And she goes, ah, yes, vinegar and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> so lo lovely little moments like that. But I, I used to escape to the loo. Um, I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but but at times, you know, I just would lock myself in the loo. I didn't need to go there, you know, and I get, mummy, mummy, and I go, I'm just in here for a few minutes, you know, I'm just going, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know, I know a few mothers who've uh, who had who that thing. Yes, just just going to just bathroom, you know. You really don't want to come in here at the moment, darling. <laughs> Oh yeah, we love them dearly, but it's it gets a little much at times. Yeah, but but they're all they're all grown up now. Um, so is this your youngest, twenty one or? No, um, she's my second oldest. So um, they are now twenty two, twenty one, nineteen, seventeen, sixteen, and fourteen. Wow, and that. That's yeah. absolutely amazing. And how have they come out with this? Because obviously the effects on, on you, um, of, of, obviously, how, you know, how has it affected them? Or have you, where you've, you've kind of been stronger and you've done, you know, and you've forgiven and, you, you, you know, ha has that affected them or? You, well, you know? I think, I think it's, it was quite difficult at first because when I moved out of the family home, I was living fairly close, but it was still kind of disruptive for the children. I wanted them to be with me most of the time and then go and see their dad now and again and, the, you know, weekends mainly, because he traveled a lot and still does. But um, the judge kind of went with what he wanted um, because he's quite a difficult character and I think the judge could see that if if my ex didn't get his way he would make things really difficult for everybody so he agreed in the end to have uh, one week with one parent the next week with the other mm. so I worried about the kids being very disrupted in their life and you know one week with 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 him one week with me I just tried to be as calm as possible 
and just be, you know, uh, as carry on as normal. I tried very hard not to go into any negativity about my ex, you know, what they did with him was what they did with him. And sometimes I get stories, but I tried very hard to uh, pull a curtain, if you like, across mm. that my personal feelings and just do what I felt was in, in their best interests and, and do fun things and, you know, um, look after them in the best way that I knew how. Um, and I think I was, I think it was very fortunate that there were six of them because, because they were quite close in age, they were very close and they still are now. And the older they get, the closer they get, which is just brilliant. So they, they became this little team and they supported each other. And I think it was hugely helpful for them to to talk about it amongst themselves without a grown-up um, and I think they're very smart kids I mean kids are always mm -hmm. very perceptive I think and and we don't give them enough credit so I think they worked out for themselves why I left or why I wanted to get away and now they're very much older, they have seen, they've witnessed the same behavior towards me, towards them. And, and the oldest boy, he got a lot of stick when I left because he was the nearest one to yeah. attack and, and blame and, and be you know, taking things out on him. And the other kids were very supportive of, of the oldest boy. And, you know, they, they could see the pattern. So without me having to spell it out for them, mm -hmm. they realized themselves. And, and I think it's a very long game. When there are children involved, I think the less you can involve them, the better. You know, yeah. it's, and that, that is something I think that, that women do because we always want to protect our yeah. children, don't we? We, we want to wrap them in cotton wool, keep them away from anything nasty or, or unpleasant. Uh, but men don't see it that way, especially men who are controlling, who are uh, bullies. Mm -hmm. They want to use anything that they can to win their little points. And if they happen to use their children, they have no compunction about that. But children will, at the time, you know, they don't understand what's going on, perhaps, uh, but they feel the effects of that. And as they get older, things start to fall into place and, and, and the puzzle starts to, you know, become clearer. Yeah. So I, I think that they're, they're very well aware of what happened and why it happened and who we are individually as parents and um you know whilst they love their father they know what his shortcomings are mm. they probably know what mine are but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah but they're not they're not going to disclose that one <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, but I'm, I'm, but I'm really proud of them all because I think they are amazing people. You know, mm -hmm. they're they've they're all different, and they've all got 